Hello, Peter. Hi. Thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Um, we're here in our new London office, Modo's new London office. So um, anybody who's watching this, please do come and see us in our office. And we've got um, we've got a, a dog with us today uh, because he insisted on coming with us. So uh, please meet Ted, the newest member of the team. Um, Peter, thanks for coming on. Um, we're going to talk today about, well, we're going to do the founder story a little bit. Um, so where you come from and, and what's all that about? Um, what's Origami up to? Um, you're, of course, the CEO and founder of Origami Energy, um, which has uh, done, done a lot in the last seven or eight years, and is, uh, has, it's got ambitious plans for the future. And then we're going to talk about the general energy system, what's happening. Um, so firstly, Peter, who are you and why are we speaking? <laughs> yeah, so um, who am I? You know, I'm, you can probably tell by my Canadian accent, um, I grew up not here. So I, I grew up in Canada. And um, I guess as a as an outdoorsy kind of person, I always wanted to look after nature, right? So when I ended up training uh, in technology, I thought, ah, maybe I can combine the two. So really, I'm a Canadian who cares about the planet, the environment, nature, but actually I'm a techno geek and, and that's really become my career. So that's kind of who I am as a technology based entrepreneur that's trying to do stuff in the sustainability sector. And so you, um, you are a STEM person, right? You're in physics or something? Yeah, like I did a PhD in physics at Oxford University. That's what got me over here from Canada. So I've been in the, been in Britain since the mid 1990s. And let's, uh, for a second, we, uh, we were having a coffee before this and we've got to talk about one thing, which is, uh, skiing up mountains right so what's the what's the skiing thing <laughs> yeah there are two types of skiing most people enjoy downhill skiing where the hard work of going up the mountain is done by a machine and then you cruise down and look cool and wear the nice sunglasses and then go to the cafe or the bar cross-country skiing is quite different that's all about spending most of your time by definition skiing up a hill with a lot of effort pain and hard work and then the reward is going down but yeah usually it's up and down, up and down mountains for hours and hours and hours while you're sweating and working very, very hard. It sounds um, enjoyable, perhaps. Like, do, you do, it on, you, you, do you do it on your own or with a big team or uh, with, with dogs? Yeah, it can be both, uh, yeah. to, alone or as a team, sometimes as a relay. Um, yeah. Usually with someone else just for safety reasons. If you're going to be in the middle of the sort of Arctic tundra somewhere, it's best not to do it by yourself in case you break something. Uh, including your leg or just a piece of equipment. So yeah, usually I did it with friends or family or something, especially if it's a point-to-point, -point, multi-day, kind of week-long ski in the middle of nowhere. Backup is good to have. Oh, wow, this escalated. So we're now talking, uh, point. these are all words that sound very impressive, point-to-point, week-long uh, escapades. Um, yeah, unless you get to the cabin at the end of the day, you die. So yeah. it's a good incentive to keep going. Yeah. And now, and so now, instead, you're doing you're you're running a company that is mostly uh, in offices or in on you know on laptops. You know, very <laughs> the complete opposite, right? Very civilized, in nice, yeah. warm, trendy yeah. offices, um, just basically coding all day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, we're a bunch of software geeks typing on laptops or on the phone with a customer, an investor, or somebody else. Yeah, so it's it's a much more sanitized environment than the the back woods that's for sure and what's what's origami about oh well yeah well we're going to talk about your previous business and experience before that uh, in, in a second but let's let's talk origami yeah you've been doing it for a few years now yeah. um what what's what's the what's the company all about yeah so why did you even create it in the first place maybe i'll start there because when i uh, i finished my first stint as ceo and i took that company public and i was you know, I was tired, I wanted a break, I needed to recharge, you know, pardon the pun. Uh, so uh, I spent two or three years uh, doing a few different things, including working in an investment company here in London. It's called Octopus, you might know it. Anyway, so I was working part- Octopus, never heard of Octopus. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. What, on earth is, what on earth is Octopus? <laughs> Who's this guy, Greg? Yeah. So I was working actually with their venture capital team that were investing in digital startups, not in energy, actually, they didn't like that. And also a bit with their energy asset investing operations, building out huge solar farms, basically. And nothing in between. I thought, oh, that's interesting. So they, When is this? Is this like early 2010s? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So I thought, ah, there's a really quite good investor. They know what they're doing. They invest millions into digital startups. Cool. And they invest billions into physical energy assets for the green energy transition. But literally zero in the overlap. I thought, oh, this is... This is crazy. This is an opportunity. So that's why I thought I'd create a business in that intersection, you know, between the, the physics of energy assets and the economics of markets and the digital glue in between was going to be origami. So when I quit Octopus just to go full bore at origami, they said, hey, pitch me the deal. So I pitched them the deal and they gave me a two million pound check as I left the building. So that was kind of the, the origins of origami. 
Okay, and how big is the company? Where is the company based? Where do you operate? Who's involved? Let's get an idea of scale. Sure. So we're, depending on how you count, around 60 or 70 people, full-time, some contractors. Uh, main uh, operations are in Cambridge. Uh, it's kind of Tech Alley in the UK, for those of your listeners who might not know. Uh, it's a bit like the MIT of Europe or the well, University in the Well, we say that stuff. in Birmingham, we're the Tech Canal. So, okay, very nice. And there's nice. a Tech Roundabout. Yeah. And there's a, um, so we're going to have to have some sort, there'll be some sort of Harry Hill style fights about That's this right. at some point. The Silicon Fen in Cambridge and the Silicon yeah. Roundabout around Oxford's Old Street. Oxford's got one as well. Yeah. What's, what does Oxford right. call itself? The Silicon? Silicon Spires, maybe? So, yeah, something I don't like know, that. Something, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll, there'll be some sort of contest, I'm sure. Uh, there, will, there will be a winner. So yeah, you're based in Cambridge. That's so. right. We have also have an office in London, about a dozen people in London, but the majority of them are in Cambridge. We have a few people in Europe, in Germany, in Austria, and kind of Central Europe, because that's a growth area for us. So yeah, we, 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 you know, we look for people who are talented. Geography is secondary. Okay, cool. And um, who's the customer? And what's the problem that Origami solves for them? Yeah, okay. So we are an out-and-out tech company. And I think a lot of startups kind of find their way in the early years to kind of really focus in what are we actually in life to do and i'd put my hand way up saying you know we were clearing the fog in the early days as well as a business so now we've nailed our colors firmly to the mass that we're an out and out independent tech platform and that independent word i'm sure we're going to come back to but basically we're not attached to a particular asset fleet or a particular trading desk or a particular route to market we're we're an independent tech layer that our customers use. And our customers uh, can, in theory, be anybody, but actually right now we're absolutely focused on asset owner operators, usually around flexible assets, um, batteries in particular, but also other types of flexibility because renewables, energy systems need flexibility to work. So we're focused on those kind of assets, but also energy services companies that also build out assets, but maybe behind the meter for customers. So one way or another, our customers are into physical stuff, into assets, usually flexible ones uh, that help balance green energy systems and either in front of the meter or behind the meter. So there either is another customer uh, on site or there isn't, it's just plugged into the grid somewhere. And, um, and what, is the, what problem does the, the platform solve? Okay, so I guess the three simplest English words I can think of that would describe why, you know, a customer... Let's do it. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah. Is, talk, talk to me like I'm a five-year-old. Yeah, exactly. So, dear five-year-old, you know, or yeah. my son when he asks what I do. So, we help our customers see what's going on, decide what to do about it, and then do it. So, see, decide, do. There's a chain of events where you need to see what's going on to make good decisions and see what's going on from physical sources like assets or financial sources like markets or contractual sources like power purchase agreements or other legal things. Decide what to do about it. You know, what's the best thing to do to either make money or save carbon or any other kind of use case you're trying to optimize and then make it happen, do it. And that do it can be something physical or something financial, you know, dispatch an asset or place a trade. So you kind of bridge that physical financial divide across that chain of events across kind of see, decide, do. Okay. And um, so what sort of, can you, are you able to name drop some customers? Yeah, So we, so sure. we can kind of um, get some, we can, we, we, can, we can put a, I don't even know what the phrase is here. Insert phrase here <laughs> that's going to help us know what's going on. That's right. You know, you, who are your customers? Pl plant a flag. Plant a flag, yeah, yeah, there yeah, you go. Yeah, I can't yeah. do this, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, who are your customers? So, so one customer we've recently announced is a customer in Manchester, that's where they're based anyway, although they're global, is uh, Elam, Elam Energy. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they, um, they're, they call themselves an energy services company. So they offer their customers um, uh, a way of going green, a way of saving money, about of generating new revenue. So quite often what they do is they deploy some new assets. Um, it could be a combined heat and power system or batteries or solar panels on the roof. And they combine that with energy that's being used or generated on that site. And they give an economic and environmental return for all of that stuff pulled together. And really what we do for them is we provide a, a layer of technology. In fact, we just signed a 20-year software as a service deal with them. So they'll be using our platform for the next 20 years and plugging various stuff into it over that 20 years. And I guess that's the, that's the key feature of an independent tech platform like Origami is that we don't know what the future is going to hold. If anybody claims to, they're probably a liar or delusional or something. Yep. So, so by, by putting that layer of technology down for a multi-year period, you can then decide, or the customer in particular can decide, what route to market they want to plug <laughs> in or whether they want to switch trading part of their portfolio with a different route to market, depending on what their turns are being you know, generated. So it gives them that control and transparency to decide how they want to run their operations, their business, and whether they want to plug different stuff into that platform over time. So in that particular use case, I can imagine 
So that sounds like optimizing assets behind the meter to provide, I really like the way you said that, uh, financial, economic, and environmental return. Yep. Which the environmental return is a little bit, it doesn't fit on an Excel spreadsheet, but it's an intangible, but it's real, right? Or you probably can put it on a spreadsheet with carbon and stuff. Um, so your software will, will, will serve that site and make sure it, it, it is optimized to do either or both of economic and, so, or, and environmental uh, return. Okay. And so I imagine there's a few aspects to that, right? There's a physical layer. You've got to control assets. You've got to be able to predict market prices. You've got to have some sort of interface to a human so, uh, and maybe some reporting. Uh, maybe some performance reporting too, and then some help for people who need to go and do maintenance. There's a few different user types in there, and that's one, that's that's behind the meter. You guys also do some front of the meter stuff, right? Yeah, uh, that's right. As well, uh, for trading desks and uh, yeah. some, some big big outfits. Yeah, yeah, so so one recent uh, deal we announced was with Gresham House, you know, one of the, the, the giants in the battery world in the UK. And, and the particular feature there, which is similar to all of the other customers that, that, were, um, that were signing, is that, um, there's a third party involved. In fact, there'll be several. You know, Habitat is the optimizer for some of those batteries, those 10 or 40 megawatt batteries that are on our platform. So again, the setup is the same where our customer wants to use our technology. Um, they happen to have one or several different route to market trader optimizers that they like to work with. And we can integrate with those different outfits. Ah, so being able to plug in different routes to market in either different bits of their portfolio or in time, they want to switch one year from one to another on the same bit of the portfolio. We're agnostic, right? That's a really important foundational belief that I had when I founded the company was we need to be scrupulously commercially neutral, right? We're not going to play markets or make, you know, have preferred, you know, uh, preferences, I guess what you say is so, so being able to facilitate different interfaces to different routes to market is absolutely fundamental to what we do. This is turning on its head though. I've just, just realized because, uh, until, well, most deals until now, the way that our, I'm, we're, we're battery people, right? I can yep. only think about things through a battery lens. It's yep. all a bang on about, I and mean, everybody who knows me knows me for that. But um, for front of the meter assets, until now, pretty much all of them, you, you're, so I, we've got Modo Battery Co, and we own, a, we own a battery, right? And we go out to an optimizer, and it, usually the optimizer chooses the whole like technology layer, right? They choose how it's optimized, whether that, you know, the, the reporting, the data I can get, all of that. What this, what you're saying, if I understand is Gresham House or another asset owner can come to, uh, to Origami and say, you know what, I'm gonna choose a technology. And then the, op the optimizers, the route to market guys, have got to plug into that. Right? Exactly. Because I'm, I'm a sophisticated operator. Yep. I need a lot more data. I understand what's going on with these assets. And I need some sort of technology to help me do that. That is absolutely what we're doing, right? We're basically defining a new product category that probably five years ago didn't exist, right? There were asset investor owner operators that built stuff. And there were routes to market traders that made money from that stuff. And it was just two parties in that relationship, right? Defense and offense, whatever you want to describe Damn. it, right? But now there's a third party, an independent technology provider that says, okay, dear sophisticated, increasingly sophisticated, increasingly complicated battery owner, operator, investor, you should probably have your own technology to make your own choices, get your own control, get your own transparency of what you want to do with that fleet. And then different traders can interface with that technology layer here, there, or wherever. So you give the control and the transparency to the customer. They can then plug in different um, uh, routes to market through increasingly standardized interfaces into that technology layer, which they then have control wow. over. So it's a fundamentally new category in the market. I've got to ask you about this then. So that role, um, one of the things that I can think of in the back of my head for, for my Kiwi Power days was that um, interface risk and all of the third parties that you have to interface with can be very costly. You can be a fantastic technology and software organization, but half of the interface side is a third party, which is outside of your control. And we, when I was at Kiwi, one of the things we talked about a lot, but we never quite got there, and I think it was a timing thing, we might be ready for that now, is standardization for interfaces. So instead of you saying to a route to market, what do you need, right? Tell me how to connect the Modbus or whatever it is you're interfacing, right? Instead, you say, okay, this is the standard. This is the standard. We've, it's a well thought out standard. You can do everything you need for, to this, right? Um, in some cases, it's a lot more complicated than just an API. But here we go. Here's a standard. If you want to work with us, this is what you've got to work to. And um, we never quite got there. And I wonder whether you, you have to do that. You're standardizing for, for, for all these guys. 
Is that how you're thinking about it? Yeah. I mean, or have it, I jumped it, ahead? It, it, not really, but I think the, the way that um, our CTO would describe it. So when I hired Steve, he's an absolute rock star technologist, and I'm so glad we have him. When he joined, he, he, during the interview, he said, you know what, Peter, I think what you want me to do is to build a change engine. And I honestly didn't have a clue what the heck he was talking about. And, and actually, now I do. And he, he was absolutely right, which is you know, rather than pretend you've got perfect foresight of knowing exactly what um, uh, you know, interface you're going to need or what value pool is going to be flavor of the month for this particular asset class, we have no idea, right? So what we need to get good at is adapting quickly and um, enabling different interfaces to be spun up within you know, minutes, right? So, so what we good, get good at is facilitating change with our technology. That is the absolute essence of what we do. So we do multiple releases a day for that very reason, is that you get good at change. So rather than solving a static problem with like a super fixed solution, you solve a dynamic problem by being able to do it, adapt it and adapt it constantly, so, but with some bedrock that you know is gonna be there for the long haul. And that's how our customers see it too, right? That technology bedrock that we provide them, 20 year SaaS is a long time, but they know that they can plug in different stuff to it over the months and years to come. And that gives them the, I guess, historically they look for commercial certainty through really long-term PPAs and you know, pricing deals. Now they get that certainty through technology certainty and knowing that they, the commercial winds will come and go and the, the sands will shift, but the tech will stay there. So, so, so basically the complete opposite of what I suggested. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you've thought it through. Um, I guess the 20 year deal, 20 year deals are, are very rare in SaaS. That's almost like the enterprise sales, like almost like box software thing from the 90s, I guess, because um, people don't want to sign those kind of contracts these days. So they, 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 um, it, you must have had to de de um, demonstrate so much future flexibility to that customer um, to, to get that over the line. So all kudos to you and the team. Everybody wants long term contracts, right? Uh, and that's fantastic. I mean, um, yeah, I'm not going to bang, bang on about Modo, but yeah, we, we, we've, we've talked about this a lot. You know, what is the right, is it, is it monthly, is it quarterly, is it yearly, is it multi-year? Um, it's a tricky question. It is a tricky question. And, and I guess the, the, the key thing you have to do if you are positioned the way we are, right, is to say, okay, there's a third party here, an independent technology platform that you can use, which is distinct and separate from either the asset owner or the route to market provider, you've got to be prepared to build and iterate and support that for the long haul. And really, that's what we've set up to do is to be that totally trusted bomb proof layer, on top of which you can put the fast and furious adaptations, you know, new applications can be spun up quite quickly, but the foundations are rock solid. So I guess that's the, the distinction I'd like to paint is that there is a, a primitive foundational layer of ingesting data or handing physical dispatch or ingesting prices, all that kind of stuff, which is rock solid. But then on top of that, we can't even dream of some of the applications that either we or actually our customers are going to develop on top of that platform yeah. over the years to come. So you get good at is, is never ending change, but with some foundations which are rock solid. There's another customer type that I think you guys serve um, some big some big ones, right? Um, which is you mentioned PPAs earlier, so PPA off takers or or um, trading houses. I don't know how you want to describe it. Um, don't you guys do some some physical dispatch for those guys as as well, or, and some uh, some screens and other bits? Yeah, that's right. So so one of our customers that's in the public domain is Smartest Energy, right? They're yep. one of the largest renewables off takers in the UK, um, and they buy from gigawatts of solar and wind farms. They provide a route to market for those green assets, uh, and they trade complicated trading strategies. You know, they're they're out and out a trading house, really. But contractually, when they sell to customers, they sign contracts called power purchase agreements (PPAs). So what they're trying to do is deal with the complexity of. Uh, figure out what each and every one of those assets is doing. Quite often they're under its own separate contract. And then figuring out whether the forecast of what should be produced by that solar farm, what's actually being produced by that solar farm, solar farm is the same or it's different. So we're trying to do kind of forecast management in a way. So that's another module that we put on our platform is called forecast management. So we don't pretend to have the best forecast. What we do do is provide a really easy way of saying what they got as a forecast from their renewables customer and what's actually being produced. Is it the same or is it different? And then they can act on that as a trader. So providing the real-time data 
and the actual insights that lets them adjust their trading on the hoof. So yeah, we do ingest data and provide that platform to trader off takers like Smartest. It lets them manage their imbalance as a trading house. It lets them either see the overall big picture, you know, all the assets put together or drilling down into individual sites within a given PPA. They can zoom in or zoom out to their asset, to their asset fleet. Cool, cool. Um, and just to, just to be clear, I think you said it earlier, but you guys don't take any positions in the markets, right? So you, um, we don't, and we never will. Right? You, we, we, we've made an absolutely, you know, um, rock solid decision on that. You know, a point of religion. So you're not an optimizer. We're not right? an optimizer. Right. We build technology to help our customers optimize stuff, to manage their forecast, to develop cool new, you know, strategies. But we won't play in the markets ourselves. We'll help tool up other people. Uh, to do that, but we're not going to do that ourselves. We're never okay. going to compete against our customers. That's a invidious position to be in. Okay, cool. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you um, about before Origami, right? You said that you you took a, com a company public. Yeah. So I assume you mean by that, as in floating on the stock market. Yeah. Yep. Um, I joined a CEO when it was a startup. Uh, it actually spun out of a, a university and then raised some money privately and then took it public on AIM here in London. And then manage it as a publicly listed company for a few years, raise some secondary placings after that. So managing the nomads, the brokers, the analysts, you know, life as a publicly listed CEO is a wild old ride and uh, <laughs> has its pros and cons, let me tell you. I've got to ask a couple of questions about it. So firstly, did you ring the bell? Yes, you I did. did get to it was that's exciting. That's the whole yeah. point, right? Yeah. That's, it not, was, that's the game of life. It was, a ring moment. That bell. it was a moment, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, we... Uh, so, we dream, right? Moda's a small private company right now, but I, 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 certainly Tim and I dream that one day we'll go public, right? We're going to take this thing all the way. And um, we, were, we were in the pub the other day and we were discussing, um, uh, because we don't, we don't really know anything really about anything, but we were discussing the, um, some of the reporting requirements of being a public company. And so what, how do they compare? What's a private company like? Can we go well off topic here? But yeah. I don't get to talk to these sort of people very often. So what's a private company like and what's a public company like to run? Yeah. So they, uh, I mean, in some ways, they're the same, right? You know, people are important. Customers are important. Money's, you know, all the standard business stuff is pretty much the same. But the, the sheer overhead of managing the public markets is like having a whole new stakeholder group to manage in your life. So you have a day job as a CEO. And that's the same as a public and a private company. But in addition, you've then got this whole new group of stakeholders in the public market. So you've got brokers, nomads, nominated advisors, analysts, uh, institutional fund managers. You know, you go on roadshows with all of your results every six months or every quarter. You have to be scrupulously careful of what you say publicly because there has to be equal information for everybody. Yeah. Otherwise, you're in deep trouble, potentially, you know, jail time, right? So you have to make sure there's fair access to information. So you can't just say what you want or do what you want. You've got to play by a very strict rule book. So that's the one of the biggest differences. So you have some magic time out of nowhere that you've got to somehow squeeze. This, I don't even know. I, I already don't have anywhere near. Like, <laughs> I, I, yeah. Um, and then on top of that, you can't even say what you want to say sometimes. No. Uh, so I don't, I don't think, I don't think I'm very well suited to this. this <laughs> um, you may or may not be. I mean, there's some real pros and there's some real cons, right? The pros are you've got uh, access to deep pools of you know, liquid capital, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to raise money and do it quickly, then being public is great. Now, there's loads of downsides, like I talked about, the admin, the time, probably a third of your time overall is just managing the public markets and all the stuff that goes around that. So you have to magic up another, you know, four, six hours a day on top of your day job to do that roughly throughout the year, which is a big deal. That's insane. Yeah. It just, it just feels like because I, I'm fighting being a grown up in every possible <laughs> But possible place that I operate, and that just feels like a place that's far too grown up. But hey ho, it's many years away and lots of success away. All right. Um, and so, what was that company called? What did it do? So, was it, it was, was it energy like, stuff? Yeah, it was energy stuff, distributed energy, actually. So, okay. really small scale, highly distributed power generation, combined heat and power, actually, based on some electric chemistry that was developed at Imperial College here in London. So, great science. But actually, when I joined, it was just that. It was just great science. It didn't have a product, didn't have customers, didn't have a business plan. So I tried to do the basics in business, which is to figure out, okay, so what's the customer need here? What are we solving actually? So don't take technology and look for a problem, actually focus on the customer. So that's really what I tried to do is bring that discipline in. And then through a bunch of fundraisers and going public, you know, the rest is history. And now it's one of the, the clean tech unicorns in the UK, which is great. Oh, great. So I'm quite pleased about that legacy, yeah. but wow, I needed a rest 
after eight and a half years on that journey, I was just exhausted. So that's why I took a, a break between CEO gigs. And so you went, I, I going, you went skiing uphill. For I went the, skiing, <laughs> I went rowing, I went cycling, yeah. exactly. Cool. And then I want to talk about origami, right? So we, we're, um, it's, it, it's clear what origami does now, um, but it's been, a, it's been a bit of a journey to get here, right? Yeah. And um, that's not me saying anything is good or bad. In fact, changing, uh, you know, pivoting and, and making decisions about strategic direction of a business is a good thing to do. I mean, at Modo, we, we spent a lot of cash before we figured out what our, jo- what our job in this world was to do, right? Uh, and we were very, very fortunate to have a team that was okay with us changing directions. We've, we've done twice now, we've realized we we're going in the wrong direction and done something completely different. Um, which is uh, scary and, and, and uh, I'm quite proud of it, but uh, it, I'm getting that off my chest because I, I didn't want to go into this thing saying, origami has changed a couple of times, you know, that's not, this isn't a safe place and I judge you. I actually think it's a great thing. So what, what's the journey been like for origami? Because I, I remember origami you know, developing battery assets and you know, doing other stuff. At one point there was perhaps uh, origami may have, may have moved into the optimization, optimization space. And that I've seen on F, you know, FFR bids with Origami's name on it. So what, what's happened in the last few years? It's clear you guys know where you're going now, but how did you get here? Yeah, so so you're right. The business success is not a linear journey, right? No. We've had a bit of a random walk, but with a very clear North Star. So I think one of the things I'm proudest of, a bit like what, how you said it, and I think, you know, if you ask my team, I think they'd probably say this is true, is that the founding vision of the company hasn't changed one iota, right? So that's been absolutely rock solid since day dot. But the how we should operate the business and the precise operating model and business model, that has tweaked and tweaked several times, mm-hmm. right? So what we're in business to do is remain the same, but how we go about doing it, we've, we've adapted that for sure. And sometimes we've done things tactically to learn and then kind of retrench back into our core focus. So yeah, the, the, the battery projects, we developed a couple that we developed and then we sold to Gore Street, then, the te- then our technology platform was used to manage those things post-construction. We never really set ourselves up to become a battery project developer Mm. ever, right? That's a completely different business discipline. But to get going, to get started, it was just a a means to an end, I guess. But in the outside world, it could have looked like, whoa, they've kind of pivoted from over here to over here. No, no, the technology that we're building every step of the way was the consistent thread. And I guess now I can wake up in the morning and say, okay, we're, we're true to who we are. We're this kind of independent technology platform in, as you described, this third party that offers our solution to our customers, as opposed to being bolted on to either a trading desk or an asset fleet. And how did you make those sort of decisions? Because, so um, I talked about this with Stephen Mearsman from Zenobi. I, I feel like if you're if you want to grow really fast as a start a startup, you guys are a bit beyond a startup. We're still a startup. It's about making lots and lots of small bets and figuring out which ones have got an asymmetric return because you've got less cash than the rest of the world, right? Our competitors have got ten times more cash than we have, yeah. so we got to do something that's a hundred times better with less cash, right? So lots and lots of small bets and then keep doubling down on the things that matter. So for example, video podcasting is something we found was pretty good, so we start we spend a lot of time money on it. Um, but you then have to have a team that is capable of hearing, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. And that's really tricky because there's pet projects and there's passion and there's specific skill sets for certain jobs that perhaps you're not going to do anymore. So developing sites, right? Origami developing sites, just one example. You might have had a, had a team of developers who were good at developing sites and then suddenly you didn't need them anymore. And so how as a business do you stay agile in saying no and doubling down on the on the asymmetric return bets and clearing the rest of the chips off the table and pull it, you know, how, how are you thinking about that problem? So you can treat that problem as a bit of a process. We've tried to do that. You know, the geek in me says, okay, if something, if you're clear about what you are going to do, you know, this stuff is on strategy, you should be equally clear about what you're not going to do. And if you do have any kind of legacies hanging around, do you stop them? Do you sell them? Do you divest them? Do you kill them? Do you renegotiate them to get them on strategy? You got to do something. Letting them hang around just creates a drag on the system. So that's the discipline we're trying to impose on ourselves is every time we clarify and re-clarify and realign on that core strategy, we re-examine anything that's not aligned to that. And then you either stop it, sell it, kill it, renegotiate it. You got to do something. And that's really the hard part because people are involved and customers are involved or employees are involved. You know, you've got to bring people with you. And, and sometimes you can't bring people with you and then you part as friends and it's all good. But you got to do something. You, you can't just have stuff which is off strategy. It will slow you down. It will be a drag on your 
resource is also a drag, not just on money and time, and but it's also a drag on your emotional energy. You know, the journey yeah. that we're on is not an easy one, right? We're doing something super ambitious, uh, super scary, super exciting. And unless you're really up for it, you're going to lose the will to live and just go do something easier probably. So, so maintaining people's enthusiasm, commitment through alignment and good communication stuff, even when you do pivot or whatever you do want to describe, is absolutely essential, right? Because it's like climbing Mount Everest, several full summits along the way. You can't, you got to go for these sprints and just keep going. Yeah, I mean, I can't count the amount of times I've just wanted to run away to the beach, uh, but you can't. So um, I want to talk about the future, right? Because um, Peter, I know you think a lot about the future and, and um, I'm not going to use the word visionary because it's a bit of a silly word, but I know you have a lot of visions for the future and you talk a lot about it in the public space. So how are you thinking about technology playing a role in the future energy system? And what kind of problems um, are, are around the corner? And how are we going to solve those? So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a geek, right? I can't help myself. I love thinking about what will be as well as what is, right? And why I founded the company a few years ago is I could see a future coming where, you know, it, it was moving from simple and static to complicated and dynamic, right? So if you look at what energy is becoming for absolutely essential environmental and social justice and other reasons, it's going to be um, really complicated, really dynamic, uh, really granular, and that needs a technology sledgehammer to manage it, to solve it, to, to kind of deal with it, to harness it. So, so I think all the futures I see coming involve more and more data, more and more complexity, more and more um, uh, granularity. You know, you're going to need a more and more powerful evolving technology set for that future. You'll also need more physical stuff. So energy worlds to go green are probably going to suck up $100 trillion of infrastructure capital between now and 2050. That by anybody's you know estimation is a lot of money, right? That is a lot of money. That's yeah. a lot of money. I can't even so, imagine what that even. I don't even know what how many. I can't even imagine that many zeros uh, on a page. I don't know how many commas. If, if you stack up pound coins, does it reach the moon? I don't know. You know, certainly four. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. So so I think the the physical energy world will be transformed through a wall of infrastructure money pumped into everything from solar and wind to batteries and EVs to grids and other stuff, right? Green electrons are going to rule the world. I think everyone's pretty clear about that. Um, and, and to harness all that complexity, uh, you're going to need more and more data, more and more tech, more and more software. So that adage from Silicon Valley that software will eat the world, I think in this space, absolutely technology is essential. You know, humans with good gut instincts and spreadsheets and post-it notes no longer cut it, right? They will fall over. They're already falling over, I think, in a lot of areas. So that's why you need to do things well with tech. There's um, one of the ways I, uh, just hearing you talk there, I, I uh, yeah, software is eating the world. I also think optimization is eating the world because we've got to the point where there's, I don't know how many billion people on the on the earth right now, but um, um arguably a lot for the amount of uh, resources we have on the planet. And so we, and, and we, we're now in a, um, I don't know, commodities super cycle, blah, blah, blah. But everything is about minerals, commodities, getting stuff out of the ground and putting it elsewhere. So uh, it feels like every aspect of, of the world, whether it's food, supply chains, energy, whatever, it's all becoming an optimization problem. It's not a, can I build more farms? Can I build more copper in the ground? Because there isn't. There, there, we don't have enough land space. There isn't any more copper you can get out of the you know, It's more expensive to get out of the ground. We don't have the carb. We can't burn carbon in the way, create carbon in the way that we wanted to. So then every single part of, uh, of, of human existence becomes an optimization problem to use the, the resources we have more efficiency, efficiently rather than create more resources. Which is cool, right? And that applies across energy and flexibility and sort of the, I'm going to say, it's almost a micro scale compared to the global problem. But that applies to shipping and oil and gas and, and, and water and everything. Um, and so technology is going to play a big role in that and, and data too. Um, sorry, I just went off on an absolute ramble. No, there, no, it's it's I've not never a ramble really at all. It's because if you look at um, what you, if you're if you're smart, like if you if you're trying to go green and you do it in a dumb way, 
you're going to dig up half the world for those yeah. minerals. If, if you go green in a smart way, the amount of physical stuff you knew is dramatically lower, right? Yeah. So, so that's really the, the optimization you talk about is if you do your systems, whether those are traffic systems, energy systems, food systems, yeah. logistic systems, if you do those in a super smart way by seeing real time with data, et cetera, et cetera, you don't need nearly as much physical infrastructure or as, much, as many physical assets to achieve the same utility value, the same actual yeah. outcome. You know, one of our geeks on our advisory board, Goran Sturbach at Imperial College, he's done a lot of these sums. You can save dramatically on the amount of uh, renewable generation you need or grid wires you need if you've got a smart energy system. You don't need nearly as much physical stuff to achieve the same outcome. So yeah, every industry you look at around the world is gonna have to tech up and get smart and harness data and optimize. Otherwise, the physical building sledgehammer just destroys the planet, yeah, right? You yeah. just can't do it. So that's why we have to go smart is to minimize the amount of physical stuff that we do need to do. It's still going to be huge, um, but isn't going to be nearly as huge as otherwise would be if we do this transition in a dumb way. Absolutely. And every system needs a self-awareness. So whether it's an energy system, electrical system, uh, whatever, it needs a self-awareness of how, how, how bad is a sled sledgehammer doing, right? And, how, and um, how do I avoid doing more of it? It's funny, though, because basically every part of human progress until now has been make more stuff, get more stuff, burn more stuff, you know. Yeah. And now it's like, okay, so you've got everything you need. Now now, now make it work, humans. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we'll start to value our human experiences more than our physical goods. Hopefully that's a direction of travel that we're all signed up to. But yeah, I think very I'm plugging in. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get a really comfy chair and some, <laughs> I don't know, some small batch millennial IPAs. I'm just going to plug in. Plug in all weekend. Uh, you'll find me in the metaverse, and then I can at least I'm going to at least I'm I'm, I'm a good person because I'm not using any carbon. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah I, I think very few people are going to put on their gravestones. I wish I owned more stuff. Right? Yeah, exactly. I, I think most people are going to say I wish I went for more bike rides or spent time with my kids or you know did the fun things in life. Right. So yeah, if you look at the big big changes in in the world, doing it in a smart way will make it you know cheaper, greener, better for the planet. You know, it's it's it, it will become obvious that you have to do it with the benefit of smarts and technology and optimization and data. The alternative is just too crazy, too expensive, too disastrous for the planet. And so, um, last thing I want to ask you about is um, it's a bit a bit off off topic, but internationals. So you guys, are, we didn't talk about it earlier. You you guys are in Europe too. Um, so, what are you doing internationally, and what do you see as where are the growth areas that you're excited about? Yeah. So we have been building something which right from the very beginning was to become a global technology platform. We always had that vision. I mean, we've overspent on the foundations unless it's going to be a global technology platform. But you got to recognize that each country, each market, is each traded exchange is a bit different. So, so you have to recognize that the local factors matter, but the foundations can be truly global. So that's really our our, our, our founding belief is that we can build a technology platform, which is literally the same everywhere in the world at its most primitive layer. Mm -hmm. And then you can build applications which acknowledge the local needs around a different grid topology, a different traded exchange, a different customer base, a different asset mix, a different regulatory model, a different, different pricing language, model, different language, yeah. exactly, a different time zone, uh, a different settlement period, all that kind of stuff, right? This is a fun game. Um, different <laughs> different national um, food. Uh, exactly. Different size to the road yeah <laughs> different approaches uh of how humans want to live their lives or go to yeah. work you know remote or on in office we'll take the whole summer off that's what we should be doing exactly like the, like the uh scandinavians yeah. so really that's the approach we've been taking is, is is try to build a truly global platform uh but also acknowledge that as you roll out in different markets in different territories uh, maybe with the same customer that they themselves are international or global in nature, they're going to have to, by definition, work with some sort of local actor or some local exchange or some local trading house or some local grid operator. You know, that's just a fact. So if you can pull the, you know, if you can pull off the best of both worlds, which is give your customer this kind of truly global tech layer, which is the same in Britain, in Germany, in the U.S., in Australia, in Japan, and also allow them to plug in stuff for the local factors, a local application for a local trading partner or whatever, then they can get the best of both worlds. And I think that's really what we're trying to do simply as a business. As it happens, most of our customers are truly global operations already. We're just choosing to work with the UK subsidiaries to focus. So let's really walk before we run, you know, get good before you get big. Oh and, yeah, you know. GB's hard enough. It, it, hard, it's know. complicated, yeah. yeah. It's a great training ground, right? It's a great test tube to build something in this space. 
uh, because a lot of other countries are following a similar, not identical, but similar regulatory model to encourage competition or more, you know, um, freely traded commercial products, all that kind of stuff. And technology as an enabler is going to help that commercial innovation. Cool. And then uh, to finish up, this is over to you. Anything that you want to plug or you want to talk about or you want to moan about? Anything that you think Gosh, we I'm, gotta do? Yeah. I'm not a moaner. I'm, I, not a if I wasn't an internal optimist, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, right? So I'm definitely a half full kind of guy, but I'm not delusional that there aren't challenges too. I mean, we're doing a lot of heavy lifting as a business. No, so I guess the the plug would be, if you're interested in working with us, you know, we're hiring people. If we, we think talent is super important to any kind of ambitious journey. So yeah, come talk. We're, we, we're, we're really keen on speaking with people who want to go on this wild and crazy, but ultimately very fulfilling ride. So cool. that would be my plug. In Cambridge or London or Yes, anywhere. or anywhere. I mean, our preferences are to be close to one of those two bases because, you know, business is a team sport. And I think yeah. it's important to get together physically in person for a whiteboard or a project session or something. But but um, we do hire people from anywhere in the world, really. Um, but it'd be great, great if you could spend some time in Cambridge or London. Okay, guys, you heard it here first. Uh, get on to Peter and, um, uh, yeah, speak, speak to Agami about your next move. Um, and Modo, by the way, we are also uh, hiring. So um, thanks, Peter, for coming on. And guys who are watching, listening, uh, the last few weeks have been great. Uh, we've had loads of feedback, people contacting us on LinkedIn and through the Modo platform, telling us what you want us to talk about and, and, and telling us what you think about the podcast. So please do keep on being in touch and uh, helping us iterate and get better at listening. All right, until next time. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure.